Once installed, the Superbump Manager panel will appear under the Nodes and Noodles or the NNN tab in the N panel of your 3D view. There's the Superbump 2 header, roll it down, and you'll get the option to import Superbump. Click on that button and browse to your downloaded blend file. Superbump version 2.0, there we go. With the correct nodes installed, Blender is ready to add Superbump to your object. Let's have a look at that object. I'm going to be working in Eevee. It's a simple plane, sized one by one, and I have it subdivided 10 times. I'm going to turn viewport denoising off to better see the details in the bump map. I'm going to activate ambient occlusion and screen space reflections. Back to the Superbump Manager, and let's add Superbump. Our plane promptly disappears, or appears to, but if you go back into solid mode, you'll see that not only is it still there, but it has been duplicated and stacked into layers. 16 layers, in fact, as specified by this input value right here, which I can, in fact, change. And this one beside it controls the height of those Superbomb layers, while down here, spread biases the concentration of density of the layers either towards the top or the bottom, depending on where it is most necessary for any given texture. Speaking of textures, that is in fact the reason for which our geometry disappears in rendered view, because Superbump does not have a height map to work with. I would select that height map from this menu, but I currently don't have any in this blend file. So I'll click here to open an image, browse to my textures folder, and I'm going to import a rocks height map. And this one in particular is rocks ground 01. Once imported, I can select it from the list. And now I'm going to click on this little button here to set that texture to non color color space. Now in rendered view, I can in fact see my rocks looking pretty good, but the layered effect is definitely very visible. So I'm going to increase the resolution by adding more layers until that banding effect disappears. Very nice. Now then, under the texture section right here, we come across node settings. First up is mode. Superbump has two modes. In mode one, it will adapt the height values of your height map from zero to one to the Superbump height specified here and the height of the given layers. It's a simple multiplication, essentially. Mode 2, on the other hand, does not perform that multiplication. It displays the height map completely unaltered. In fact, if I were to make the super bump height of 1, you'll see all the details of the height map. Mode 2 is for when you'll be manipulating the height map output yourself within your material with math nodes and the like. For now, I'm going to stick with mode 1. Now then, let's have a look at the bottom of our shell. I'll add a point light so we can see it a little better. And as is almost always a good idea to do with Superbump, I'm going to activate contact shadows right there. Now then, back to the shell. The shell at the bottom is flat. It is a perfectly flat plane, while the shape of the displacement is all happening at the top of the shell right there. If I activate hollow, you'll see that the shape of the top of the shell actually gets reflected in the bottom of the shell with some thickness added. And that thickness can be specified right here, just like that. With hollow active, you can also invert the super bump height to invert the effect of your height map and the displacement and to create some occasionally unexpectedly pleasing results. I'll pump that back up to 0.1. And the final option of the node settings is culling. Simply backface culling. I'll turn that on. You'll see it disappears until I am looking at it from above. The reason for culling is not so apparent as long as your geometry, the original geometry, is flat. But if you have a hill or curve or similar to your geometry, let me introduce a hill just like that. You'll see that when viewed from behind or below, Superbump displacement can display this unsightly black shadow, and backface culling will fix that problem for you, nice and easy. Just like that. For now, I'm going to turn culling and hollow back off. The next option is the Use Vertex Group. We can use a vertex group to mask out the Superbump effect. 
I'll turn that on, but we see no change because I don't actually have any vertex groups associated to this object. And I can't create them from this menu, so I'm going to create them from the properties panel over here. Let's click on plus to create a new group, and I'll give it the name SB group or Superbomb group. I'll tab into edit mode, and let's make a quick random selection of faces, just like that, and assign them to my new vertex group. Back to rendered view, and I can select that group from the menu and click on update. And you'll see that Superbump is now respecting that vertex group. I can also, at this point, activate the hollow function, and the areas where there is no Superbump will actually be transparent. And we also have the option to smooth the vertex group, which can produce some pretty random effects, but the modifier offers the option, so I included it in Superbump. Why not? I'll turn hollow back off. Now then, as we've already seen, the Superbump layers will reflect any changes you make to the original geometry, but if you add modifiers to that original object, that will not automatically get reflected in the Superbump layers. Let me add some arrays here for demonstration. You can see that my bottom layer is getting duplicated by my arrays, but the Superbump layers are not. Simple matter of clicking right here, refresh Superbump, and there you go. It'll update all the Superbump layers to reflect the modifiers used by the original object. I can come back and remove those modifiers. Refresh Superbump, and we're back to the original. Just below that, we find Apply Superbump. This is for when you've finished setting up your Superbump model, you're happy with how it looks. Click on Apply Superbump with the object selected. It will apply all modifiers to the object. It will make all the Superbump layers real geometry and it will join all those layers together into one single object with the Superbump material attached. For further use in Blender, this will produce better performance than having the dynamic Superbump layers attached using modifiers and so on. And this object can also be exported for use in other engines like game engines. I have included nodes for creating Superbump materials in both Unity and Unreal. And the final option, is to remove Superbump. I can click here to remove all of the Superbump layers and to get back to my original object. This option does not, however, remove the Superbump nodes from the material. In my experience, spontaneously disappearing nodes and noodles can cause chaos in a node network. So I thought it best to leave it up to the user to go in and remove those nodes themselves in the shader editor. And speaking of the shader editor, the shader editor has its own Superbump panel right here under the NNN tab. Yet again, Superbump 2, roll it down. We have the same options to add Superbump to our object right here. I'll go ahead and do that. And then we have the same options as far as height and layers and so on, the spread and hiding the layers, vertex groups. We don't need access to the node inputs because the node is right here. We can make those changes from here. And you'll see that we also have three extra options to add some nodes to our network. These are the Superbump nodes. Three options, Superbump itself. This is the main Superbump node, which is already included in my material. And this is the one that makes the magic happen. We have the World to UV node, which takes a vector in world space and transforms it into UV space. So we can use this node to add, for example, wind and gravity effects to our Superbump displacement. And finally, the Layer Strength node, which is an intensity control which is layer dependent. So you can apply effects more strongly to layers higher up in the shell. This node is pretty fundamental to creating, for example, grass which would bend in the wind and uh, droop with gravity and so on. And in fact, to demonstrate that, Let's come back to the main 3D view and we'll create the new models. Let's begin by removing Superbump and deleting this plane. I'm going to add a UV sphere, click on it, give it a material, and click on Add Superbump. As expected, my sphere disappears and I'm going to go straight over to the shader editor. Now then, I'm going to be using the Clover texture set, which you'll find available for download on your Gumroad product page. 
So I'm going to click on open and browse to my textures folder, and I'm going to import the height map. Set that height map to non color color space. And we've got some clover, albeit discolored. Let's bring in the rest of the textures. I'm going to click texture, multiple images, and back to my textures folder. Let's get albedo, normal, and roughness. Import those textures and hook them up. Albedo goes to base color and the color space should be sRGB. Roughness, I'm going to separate with a separate RGB and I'm going to set the color space to non color. Plug that into the roughness of the principal shader. And finally, the normal map also should be in non color color space. And I'll add normal map node. Hook everything up and plug the normal output of the normal map node into the input of the bump. And there we go. We've got our clover. The UV unwrapping of the UV sphere tends to stretch textures horizontally a little bit. So to fix that, I use a UV map node connected to all of those textures. Join those noodles with a reroute and drop on a vector map node. Nice and easy. We'll set it to multiply and give it two for the x channel one for the y and the z isn't really important in this case because a uv map only deals with x and y there we go we got our texture looking much better now then to create the grass this is the grassy effect you've seen in the demo blend file this is grassy suzanne and how that material was made so let's come over to the super bump panel and simply drag up that super bump height way bigger than it should be now we get a lot more layers for resolution. Very good. And I'm going to change the scale. I'm going to shrink this texture down quite a bit, maintaining this double in figures. X must always be double Y. So if I set X to, for example, 20 and Y to 10, there we go. That's very fine, looking more like hair than grass. So let's calm that down a little bit. Let's go for 10 and 5. Okay, that looks good. I'm going to get some more layers because I can definitely see the banding. And I'm going to use the spread effect to bias the density of layers towards the top of the shell. So I'm going to drag the spread downwards. Okay. Now then, I'm going to add a gravity effect to this, whatever you want to call it, hair, grass, don't know, don't know what it is. Let's call it grass, I've decided. There we go. Okay, I'm going to need more space here between my UV map and this multiply node. Let us add a world to UV node and a layer strength node. Let's bring them over here. Drop the world to UV onto the noodle coming from the UV map. Let's get ourselves a vector math node, and I'm going to use this node to create a vector in the top input, which points straight downwards. So minus one on the z-axis, and this is essentially a very simplified gravity vector. I'm going to multiply that gravity vector by the output of my super bump layer strength node, and plug the result into the bottom of the super bump world to UV, and there you have it. The hair, I, decide, I decided it was going to be grass. The grass is now drooping with gravity. Let's have a look at the inputs of this node here. We've got factor, this is clearly the strength of the effect. For this effect, you will almost always want to be using very small numbers. This, this is actual displacement along the UV map, so small numbers can create a very big effect. And we also have the curve effect, fairly self-explanatory. If I turn that up, two and a half, something like that, you'll see that the droop is much more curved. The further we are away from the root of the grass, the more it droops. So that is Superbump. That's the manager. Those are the nodes. That's what they do. And that is how you use them.